again. In thunder, lightning, or in rain. When the hurly burly's done. When the battle's lost and won. That'll be air. The set of sun. Where the place? Upon the heath. There to meet with Macbeth. Fair is foul, and foul is fair. Hover through the fog and filth the air. Fair is foul, and foul is fair. Hover through the fog and filth the air. Well, that was a little bit creepy. Welcome 10th grade, Oak Ridge, survey of British literature class, to another installment of our podcast series. Uh, This episode, we're going to be introducing, setting up, the play Macbeth by William Shakespeare. We read Richard III last semester, uh, a history play by our famous playwright. And this semester, we're going to be Uh, looking at one of his most famous tragedies, Macbeth, set in medieval Scotland about a Scottish noble who, like Richard III from our previous reading, convinces himself that he should be king. This is another story about an overreacher, a character whose waxen wings fly too high. Think about Victor Frankenstein, Think about the ancient mariner, Satan from Paradise Lost, and yes, Richard III. All these characters, like Macbeth, have a driving ambition where to achieve what they want, they often do things that have dire consequences. And in this case, Shakespeare presents us with such a story in the classical form of what we call an Aristotelian tragedy. I'm going to take you on a little journey, a journey across the Oak Ridge campus. I decided that instead of having me talk at you and introduce this play, why not crowdsource such a thing? Why not go talk to Mr. DeBoard, our drama director, Mr. Renshaw, our 12th grade AP literature teacher, perhaps say Mr. Ray, our resident expert on all things related to medieval history. Here's a little sample of the kind of insight I gained by just walking across the Oak Ridge campus and opening my mind to the vast amount of rich resources we have in the form of teachers and students and the kind of learning and knowledge they bring to the table. Here's a little sample from my conversation with Mr. Brad DeBoard, the drama director here at the Oak Ridge School. Hello. What's going on, drama class? Say hello to the podcast. Hello, hello. podcast. Hello, hey. podcast. All right. Well, yeah. So, Mr. DeBoard, um, as you may already know, uh, as I do every year, we're about to start reading Macbeth in my tenth grade English class. Woo! Or shall I ask you? Should I have even uttered the name? No, you're fine. Okay. Okay. So you you can't whistle, but you can say Macbeth. Okay, and we're not we're not anywhere near a stage at the moment. Yeah, so we're so okay. we're kind of we're in we're in the clear then. Yeah. Okay, good, good. <laughs> so, anyways, um, you're the drama director here mm-hmm. at the Oak Ridge School. Yes. I'm an English teacher. We kind of approach this with different lenses. Well, as a drama director, how do you how do you stage this play? How, how would you direct this play? First thing is you have to approach Macbeth. I think as a ghost story, as a uh, work of horror. Right. Uh, and you're. Your witches have to be scary. Uh, the violence has to be over the top. Uh, I mean, it, it should make your audience feel uneasy. Uh, they should be unnerved every time the witches take the stage. Okay, so there's a sample. Thanks, Mr. DeBoard, for joining us. But uh, let's not get ahead of ourselves. I'm going to take you back to the beginning of the day um, as I walk through it. Uh, we're going to hear from some students in the hallways. Uh, we're also going to hear from Mr. Ray, 
middle school history teacher. And perhaps we'll stop and talk to some more students, and by the end of the day, we will uh, conclude our discussion with Mr. Renshaw, your future senior English teacher. But let's begin in the hallways of the Oak Ridge School in the early morning hours on any given day. Good morning. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I like that color. Hey, thank you. Now, good morning, guys. How are you doing? Good. How are you doing? Actually, I have a really great question for you guys. Yes. Okay. So, I had you guys for class two years ago. Why don't you tell me who you are? I'm Sarah Mitchell. Okay. What grade are you in? I'm a senior. All right. All right. Who are you? I'm Christian Thomas. Okay. What grade are you in? I'm also a senior. All right. Well, the reason I stopped you in the hall is 10th grade year, we read Macbeth together. Yeah. I believe you guys read it again your senior year very, very, very quickly, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So, tell me, what, what about Macbeth impacted you as a play? as a character, um, not to put you on the spot. <laughs> I don't know, I thought it was cool how they switched, um, like their morality changed, because uh -huh, uh -huh. I don't think that I've seen that in a different story, like where the good guy becomes the bad guy and the bad guy becomes the good guy, I guess. Okay, okay. Like between Lady Macbeth and Macbeth. Yeah, fair is foul, yes. foul is fair, <laughs> right, yeah? Yeah, excellent, well hey guys, thanks a lot. All right, no All right. have a good day. Hey, what's going on, guys? Hey, smile for the podcast, all right? Oh, all right. Okay. So, what I'm here to put you on the spot about is, Abby, yes. say hello to your class. This is going to be on the podcast. Hi, guys. All right, everybody else here, you're either in 11th grade or 12th grade. Why don't you introduce oh. yourself? Who are you? I'm James Common. Okay, what grade are you in? I'm in 12th grade. All right, who are you? I'm Maddie Kinsley. I'm in the 12th grade. Can you say it one more time? I'm Maddie Kinsley. I'm in the 12th grade. Okay, and who are you? I'm Zoe Miller. I'm in the 11th grade. Okay, who are you? I'm Paige Levine, I'm in the 11th grade. And who are you? I'm Michael Greer and I'm in the 12th grade. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you a couple questions. Just identify yourselves when you want to answer, all right? So you read Macbeth with me your sophomore year and some of you seniors in this circle have read it for a second time with Mr. Renshaw, right? A much more swift reading, but you know, you did it again. So what about this Scottish play stuck with you? What impacted you about this play? I would say what impacted me was the Who concept of will. I'm James Common. Oh, okay, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I'd say what impacted me was the concept of will and how we tend to read it in a modern light from a sort of free will perspective on the part of Macbeth, which sort of clashes with the how it would be viewed when it was written so, and first performed. So are you getting at the, you know, whether he had a choice yes. in this whole progression that becomes a tragedy? Yes. Interesting. And so what's your reading? Did he have a choice? Well, my reading is very 21st century, and I would say yes. Uh -huh. I blame him for what he does. Um, but I don't think that would be the Elizabethan reading. Does that make it more tragic or less tragic? I don't really care. You don't really care? All right. Well, hey. Okay. Well, okay, say, who are you? This is Zoe Miller. Okay. Here Zoe. to argue with James. Okay. Um, I think that it does, as always. I think it makes it more tragic because it kind of shows you that rather than, like, you know, in a Greek tragedy where people aren't responsible for their own actions, it's more like it's, it should almost scare you because it shows you that you're capable of destroying your entire life okay. by one choice that you make. So that's scarier than being then, like... Yeah, than something being beyond your control. It's almost, I have the power to totally mess things up. Right. I would right. agree with that. But the reason I say like I don't really like bother having an opinion on that is because I think it's completely subjective and it depends on your value system. And that's why we view it so differently 400 years later from when it was actually written. Okay, okay. Well, hey, anybody want to have the last word? Paige? Yeah. Eh? Eh? So. Okay, all right. Well, Abby, you might make an appearance in our podcast. I'll see you guys later. Thanks a lot. You're very awesome. Hey. Hey, podcast. This is, uh, this is for my 10th graders. They're about to read Macbeth. Do you remember Macbeth? You've read it twice. Yes, unfortunately. Unfortunately? <laughs> well, what, would you, what do you want them to hear before they read this? Remember, we're getting them excited about it. Um, it was one of the more memorable books I've ever read. It was. It was, pretty, it was pretty good, especially um, towards the end. All the action kind of culminated into... It kind of accelerates quickly, doesn't it? Yeah, it accelerates it? very quickly. Yes. Yeah. That's true. So you liked all the violence? Oh, yeah. Yeah, all right. Completely. That was Chris Bell, senior at the Oak Ridge School, and I have to agree with him. 
The action-packed violence of this play makes it all the more thrilling and more compelling as a drama. But just a quick recap on what we've heard so far. Mr. DeBoard emphasized to us that this play has got to be scary. And I think what's implied there is it's difficult to capture our fear and our anxiety when presented with something like witches, which have been so domesticated in our culture, whether it be with stories like Wicked or teenage dramas like Beautiful Creatures. We have to remind ourselves that this is meant to be a scary story. I also like what Sarah Mitchell had to say about character development. Um, there's an interesting symmetry to character development. Uh, as certain characters become more morally depraved, other characters seem to become more morally aware of what they're doing. And so there's a kind of crisscross pattern, uh, what Aristotle will call peripety. I also enjoyed the discussion between Zoe Miller and James Coman. What an interesting question. How responsible is Macbeth for his own tragedy? Is this a tragedy of choice? Or is this a tragedy of fate? Is Macbeth in control of his own decision making? Or are there forces beyond him that are pushing him towards this catastrophic end? Here's what student Elise Dolan had to say, and I think it runs contrary to what James Coman was telling us. Um, I think they need to look at it not through a modern view. Okay. Because then I know a lot of my peers really did not like Macbeth, which kind of changed their outlook on the, on the whole play. But if you look at it through the eyes of someone back during Shakespeare's time who did believe that you can't control your own, your own fate. Yeah, yeah. If you look through their eyes, you can sympathize more with Macbeth. Right. Which and is how I did, and I ended up really liking the play, and I felt bad for Macbeth at certain points. So there doesn't seem to be a consensus on how one should read this play. But from my perspective, that makes it all the more rewarding as a literary journey where different readings can be had and discussed and debated. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. I think we need to turn back the clock and look at the real historical perspective of this character, Macbeth. In order to do that, I'm gonna take you over to the middle school and let's have a little chat with our expert medieval historian, Mr. William Ray. Hey, how are you doing? Okay. We've made it to Mr. Ray's room. Why don't you uh, introduce yourself to our uh, live podcast here? Ah, my name is uh, William Ray. I am the sixth grade world history teacher and a research historian. I'm about to begin the quote-unquote Scottish play ah, yes. with uh, my 10th graders. Uh, we'll begin reading it next week. And I'm trying to set this up for them from all sorts of angles. Um, from the dramatic, theatrical angle, how this play was staged, from the literary perspective, what kinds of terms and concepts might we need to unpack to understand it as a piece of literature. But what I've come to talk to you about today is, is the actual historical context. Um, let's just start with when and where. So Scotland was actually united. They had four kingdoms. Okay. And Malcolm II, when he became king, he managed to unite all of these and make what we would now consider Scotland. So this is a long time ago. So long as about 1040. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's uh, what 11th century. Yes. Oh wow. Okay. So, so considering how long ago this was, and I'm guessing you know uh, Scotland wasn't too uh, sophisticated yet in terms of a widespread educated populace, right? And so, what do we really know about this time period? Uh, the populace was not terribly educated. The upper classes, which Macbeth was, were very educated. Okay. They were educated in the monasteries. In fact, as king... Now, is that what a thane is? Is a thane a, a, like an right. upper class person? Right. Okay. The, th the thanes are the upper crust. Uh, they would have a good education for the period. In fact, Macbeth as king actually made pilgrimage to Rome at one point. Really? So he was actually very well traveled. So this isn't some backwoods, dark ages, barbaric warrior we're talking about here. No, they were uh, pretty much on par with most of England at this point. Okay, okay. So, what do we know? So there really was a guy named Macbeth. Yes. 
much like there really was a Richard III. They read Richard III last semester. Absolutely. So there really was this guy, Macbeth. And so was he really king? Uh, Macbeth was king. It, this was uh, the old story of a dynasty in question. You had uh, oh, the we're king, familiar with these. Yeah, you had Malcolm II died at about the age of 80. Okay. Uh, his grandson, Duncan, then took the throne. Duncan was fairly young and uh, proved very quickly he was incompetent as a ruler. Mm. When he tried to invade Northumbria, he was incompetent as a military commander. Okay. Uh, the feeling rose among the Scottish nobles, this is not going to work. Yeah. Because they're under threat from the English, they're under threat from the Danes, they're under threat from all kinds of different directions. Yeah. So a revolt came, started, and uh, if the revolt is going to succeed, they need to find somebody else with a claim to the throne. Macbeth is a relation to the king through a king. Yeah, yeah. So they picked Macbeth, and initially he was not part of this, but then he re they talked him into it, so he said, all right, I will be the king if you win. So what I hear is how he ascends to power is not quite the story Shakespeare tells us. No. But at the same time, there is a lot of similarities. Like, when you start this play, Macbeth is a general. And he is fighting a, pretty much a three-front war. Right. From what I understand, he's fighting uh, certain Irish armies, um, Norwegian armies from the north, right. but also Scottish rebel armies. Absolutely. And in fact, that's why he is going to gain a new title uh, um, by the end of Act One, because he's defeated a Scottish noble who lost his title. Right. right? So it is true that who was ruling what and who can consolidate what was really in the air at that time. It exactly. was ambiguous. It wasn't It wasn't set in stone like a modern nation today. No, it was basically like England had the problem. This was contending power groups. Mm. And uh, Duncan, uh, as opposed to what Shakespeare wrote, Duncan was actually young and had proven himself to be incompetent in very many, in a whole lot of different ways. Yeah, and you know, maybe Shakespeare hints at that at least in terms of how we, we seem to receive Duncan as almost a comic character. In, in, in the play. I mean, he's somewhat dense. Yes. He, he, uh, he cannot see Macbeth's intention. But he, uh, he actually dies on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. Macbeth then will become king. Oh, so Macbeth didn't have him murdered? Uh, no, this was, this was basically combat casualties. Okay. Uh, at that time in Scotland and other places, the king himself is a warrior, think Richard III. Mm -hmm. He was a combat death. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Duncan was a combat death. Well, in, in, how interesting. I see so many parallels between the Shakespeare play we read last semester and this one in terms of historical context. Mm -hmm. And what I mean is, and, and, and my students know what I'm talking about here, but the Wars of the Roses, um, uh, basically the context of Richard III, there were multiple claims to the throne, and it wasn't clear who should inherit what. Right. And there is a legitimate argument to be made that Richard III had as good of a claim as pretty much anyone else. True. But then we tell the stories, and then we seek the drama in our stories, right. and we exaggerate, and we, we smudge a fact here, you know, we dim this down over here, and, and light up this aspect of it over there. Right. And before you know it, we have this maniacal, Machiavellian Richard III that has forever captured our attention. Right. What do, I mean, I wonder what we know. Do we know anything about this real Macbeth guy? Real Macbeth, uh, like I said, for the period, he was very well educated. He, uh, when he claimed, he was a very competent general. When he claimed the throne, he, uh, for about the first 14, 15 years, he was a, considered a very good monarch. Mm. He was a very supportive of the church. He made pilgrimage to Rome and uh, basically was showering money on the churches all the way there and back. Mm. Uh, the problem was, and this is always a difficulty when you have these dynastic battles. Mm -hmm. There were other claimants. Well, how interesting to see what Shakespeare gets right about history right. and what he obviously changes, and usually for good reasons when it comes to the dramatic perspective. Right. You know, Shakespeare knows how to craft some drama. Absolutely. Also, remember, Shakespeare is writing this thing. Well, I always enjoy picking Mr. Ray's brain. He's such a wealth of historical knowledge. Our conversation continued, and Mr. Ray went on to also tell us a little bit about Shakespeare's historical context when writing 
the Scottish play. And I'm not going to go too much into it now. I think we'll save that conversation for a later time. But it might be important to note that Shakespeare wrote Macbeth when there was a new king on the throne. Queen Elizabeth had passed away, the last of the Tudor dynasty, and in her place was James I. And he was the first ruler of the Stuart dynasty, which one should note, it was a Scottish dynasty now ruling over an English nation. And we'll return to that context from which Shakespeare crafts this play after we've read the first three acts of what is one of Shakespeare's finest tragedies. After visiting the middle school, which is always a pleasure, I returned back to my room to eat lunch with a fantastic group of students. I asked them some of the same questions you've already heard me pose, but we also talked about Macbeth in relation to our previous text of study, Shakespeare's Richard III. So check out what they had to say. One more question that I'm kind of wrestling with. They've read Richard III. You guys know that play? Yes. yes. Uh-huh. Yeah, I bet you do, right? Because you read it last year as well, didn't you? We participated in the colloquium. And you guys went to a colloquium where you yeah. presented papers. Yeah, and I did a scene from it. Hey, so, went yeah. to workshops. Yeah, yeah, so we yeah. know this play well. Well, so do my 10th graders. They read it last semester. They wrote term papers on it. They really absorbed this one. So what could they bring from their experience of Richard III? I would say... Sorry. Um, I would say um, the female characters, specifically, like, Lady Macbeth is very, like, controlling and stuff. Yeah. And you see that kind of in Richard III, not so much with Anne, but, like, with Margaret. And, like... They both have so much verbal power. Yes. Right? Yeah. Like, when Anne... Or, sorry, excuse me. When Queen Margaret curses yeah. someone, there's power behind it, right? And when Lady Macbeth chides Macbeth, right, it, 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 it makes you wonder where is this choice coming from? Is it Macbeth's choice or is, is it Lady Macbeth's, mm -hmm. right? I think Macbeth is definitely one, um, is a play where you're definitely, definitely finally going to find a really strong female character's voice. So there's a little more empowerment in this character? Especially like in, like as a main character, whereas Queen Margaret was kind of like in one scene only, so to speak. You know? I would agree with that. Well, yeah, one critic said that the female characters are relegated to the sidelines to curse and mourn in Richard III. Whereas we might say Lady Macbeth has a central role in driving this story forward, right? Okay, guys, thanks a lot for joining me on this conversation. Yes, I'll let you have your lunch now. Thank you. All right, thanks, guys. So that was Teresa Clifford and Summer Hayter, both juniors here at the Oak Ridge School. I've been hearing this a lot today as I've spoken to various students and teachers and other personalities. Lady Macbeth is quite the compelling character. Pay attention to her development. Really absorb her ability to exercise verbal power over other characters, in this case, namely Macbeth. Well, I made one more stop at the end of my day and that was Mr. Renshaw's class, Oak Ridge's senior expert on all things related to AP Lit. All right, well, here I am, class. I'm now sitting down with Mr. Renshaw, your future 12th grade English teacher, uh, expert in all things AP Lit. Uh, I, think, uh, I think, Mr. Renshaw, it's safe to say that you've had some experience with this text. I, I think I've taught Macbeth uh, for 20 years now. Uh, I've taught it to sophomores. I always teach it to seniors in an introductory fashion. We do it very quickly because I know they've already had it as sophomores, but yes, I'm very familiar with it. I've even actually been in the play. Oh, right, yeah. I remember seeing you play the porter, actually, the which porter, is a fun yes. role. Yeah, absolutely. All right, well, here, I'm about to start teaching this tragedy to my sophomores. They've had some Shakespeare, um, but they've never read what I would call a classic Shakespeare tragedy. We read a history play first semester. Um, they did uh, a Midsummer's Night's Dream their freshman year. It's comedy. Right, exactly. So this is their first time to like, you know, encounter capital T tragedy. And before we even get into that and, and unpacking what we might mean by that, what, what do you want them to know about this play before they start reading? Everything comes down to the witches. It's all about the witches. And, and I, I suspect we'll end up talking about Aristotelian tragedy. Mm, yeah. Uh, and I'll come back to that in a few minutes. And, uh, you know, and that's clearly a significant part of 
of any lesson with, with Macbeth, but everything to me in this play comes down to the witches. Mm. If the witches aren't scary to you as a reader or an audience member, then you don't give the witches any power. Wait, that sounds a lot like what Mr. DeBoard told us at the very beginning of this journey. This play has got to be scary. All right, back to Renshaw. Right, if the witches yeah. don't have power, then Macbeth is doing everything on his own. Again, this is all sounding so familiar. Because that comment reminds me of the discussion James Coman and Zoe Miller were having about how much choice Macbeth has and how much of this drama is outside of his control. Back to Renshaw. And that has to do with the tie-in to the Aristotelian tragedy. Tragedy. Do you want to unpack that for them? Well, you know, tragedy is a, is a word that has lots of different connotations associated with depending on what context you're using it in. When we talk about Aristotelian tragedy, what we're really talking about are a certain set of story elements mm -hmm. as identified by Aristotle thousands mm -hmm. of years ago. What's not clearly identified in Aristotelian tragedy elements is one key component of the Greek culture, mm -hmm. which is significantly different than the modern American culture, modern Western culture, mm -hmm. and it's ultimately why I think Macbeth fails when it's performed. And what's that? Fate. The Greeks believed in fate. Right, right. They believed everyone had an inescapable destiny and that anything you did to try to escape your destiny caused it to happen. Let's let's perhaps unpack a few terms. I think we're getting at an idea of what tragedy is, but what else would you what are some other concepts they might they might be aware of to, to understand the Aristotelian tragedy? Well, ultimately the, the Aristotelian hero is someone who is typically important. Right. He is he's not a nobody. And, and Macbeth's a general. Macbeth is a general and a thane. He is a, of noble birth, and generally, the, the, the Aristotelian hero is also a noble character. He's generally a good person, but he's got a flaw. Right. The, uh, the tragic flaw is something in his character that just makes him do bad things. Right, and, and, and when we come to this concept of catharsis, would you, right. would you talk a little bit about that? So, one of the, catharsis is, the, the general usage of the word has to do with the emotional release, the audience sort of having a purging of emotion. Yeah. You, would you agree with oh, that? Oh yeah, assessment? absolutely. And and that's the, the general term, this this emotional release. You, you've seen all of these things and you have to get it out of your system. Uh, and so whatever bad thing ends up happening because of the, of the bad stuff the hero has done, that bad thing is necessary for the cathartic purging. Right, right. And you know, and just harping on that, another word that we have brought up before, and I know they heard in other classes, is pathos. and it's, it's like, to me, that catharsis is, is even beyond pathos. Pathos, we, like, we identify with the character, you know, Marley and me, dog dies, oh, I've had a dog die, or I can imagine what it's like to have a dog die. Right. And so I'm, I'm teary-eyed, I have pathos, but catharsis is like those events that are bigger than just like something we identify with. It's, right. It's something that, and therefore, we come together as a culture. Right, right? It's, a, it's a cultural moment where everyone expresses together. Yeah, and so as we read Macbeth, if an Aristotelian tragedy is good, we as a class, when we get to Act 5, should be having this experience of catharsis. Right. Right. Well, is there anything else you want to add? Yeah, I'd, I'd actually like to come full circle back to the witches just for Go a moment. For it, yeah. Because I, I think we've said a lot of stuff now that speaks back to that. I said at the beginning of this that to me, everything comes down to the witches. If they're not scary to you as an audience, then they don't have power. Right. And if they don't have power, then they are not the supernatural influence affecting Macbeth's actions. The ancient Greeks believed in fate. There are three witches as there were three fates. So it, it dilutes the cathartic yes. impact. And, and it, because it dilutes the cathartic impact, if you don't believe the witches are scary, then you are completely missing what Macbeth Macbeth is about. And then it becomes this distant Shakespearean text. About a guy who does bad stuff. Right, exactly. Rather than a guy who is victim to forces beyond his control. Wow. Well, great discussion. Thank you, Mr. Renshaw. Sure. Appreciate it. And uh, look forward to it senior year, guys, because you're going to read it again with Mr. Renshaw. Wow. Couldn't have said it better myself. What an amazing campus we have here. So much knowledge, so much insight, so many interesting perspectives. Well, I hope you enjoyed this latest episode of our podcast series. I look forward to getting into this text with you guys on Monday. It's going to be a really, really fun journey. 
Take care.